So we are in the final of the 12 minor prophets studying the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi written post-exile to the people of Judah because that's, that's the only community that's left. Remember, we're in the divided kingdom after the divided kingdom period when the northern tribes are gone. They've been taken into exile and ultimately vanished in some way. And then the southern tribes have been, uh, uh, the southern tribe of Judah and Benjamin have been taken off to, um, to exile in Babylon, allowed to return by the Persians. So in the Hebrew Bible, the book of the 12, Malachi being the last prophet. On our timeline that we've been using, Malachi is the last book written of the prophetic books. Remember, it's written during the, reign, uh, the time of the Persian Empire. So the greatest kingdom the world had ever known at that time, encompassing, of course, Palestine. And if we're looking at the book of Malachi specifically, here's a helpful timeline. So remember, we've talked about the fact that Cyrus conquers Babylon. And so he is the Persian king, Cyrus the Great, who allows the Jews to return and allows them to begin to rebuild their temple. And he helps pay for it. However, they stop. They get caught up in lots of other things. Darius becomes king. And as we studied, Haggai and Zechariah are all about, let's get this temple rebuilt. So the temple is completed in 515 um, B.C., But we still have the issue of the city of Jerusalem, which is not protected. It has no walls built. And so the story of Nehemiah is all about building the walls around Jerusalem. And so in 443, the walls of Jerusalem are built. And it's around this time period after that, that Malachi begins his prophetic ministry. So I've got one outline here uh, just to kind of break down the book for you. You've got four chapters in the book of Malachi. And the first or most of the book is really about disputes between God or the Lord and his people. So uh, as we'll see, there are several times that God says, I have this bone to pick with you or I have this issue with you. But it seems as if he's really responding to the fact that they're putting God on trial. So they have their own questions of God. And so what he does in the book of Malachi is he answers those things. He says, you say this, but I'll say this. Okay, and we'll see that as we move through the book. So the book begins with the words of prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. So this is chapter one, verse one. The, it's a little different than the way most of the prophetic books start because usually they say something like the word of the Lord came to so-and-so who was a prophet. But here we have the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Malachi just means my messenger. And so it literally could be not a proper name. It could be the word of the Lord to Israel through my messenger. And we don't know who that is. We don't know anything about Malachi aside from the fact that he is associated with this book. So even if it's just my messenger, I'm going to keep calling it Malachi. And it's going to be helpful for all of us to to do that as we move along. So there are a series of questions that God says, you, you say this, or you ask this throughout the book of Malachi. And what I want to do is we'll look at each one of these and they'll kind of help break down the book. We don't have time to read the whole book, but we'll read large sections of it. And you'll see the questions that the people have asked of God. But you ask, how have you loved us? But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? But you ask, how have we defiled you? But you profane it by saying the Lord's table is defiled. And you say, what a burden, and you sniff at it contemptuously. All right, so that's chapter 1 in verse 12. Chapter 2, you weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask, why? How have we wearied him, you ask? But you ask, how are we to return? But you ask, how are we robbing you? Yet you ask, what have we said against you? Okay, so what we're going to do is just go through each one of these, and it'll kind of lay out what Malachi is all about. So let's start with the first one. But you ask, how have you loved us? So this is how the book begins. After chapter one, verse one, verse two says, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I have turned his hill country into wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. 
Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will build the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You see it with your own eyes and say, great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. So, he starts off and says, I love you. And they say, oh really? How have you loved us? So he gives the example of their history, which it says, I chose you. Was not Esau Jacob's brother? So you've got Jacob, Israel, and his brother Esau. You know that story, right? And God chose one and not the other. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. We'll talk about the difficulty of that verse in just a moment. But his evidence is this. You are my chosen people. Look what I've done to Esau and his descendants. I've said they're not going to be great, and they're not great. I've punished them, and they're punished. So the evidence that I love you is you are still around. But we do have this difficulty. I've loved Jacob, Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Um, And I'll try not to get uh, too cute with this, but I will say that every time we come across something like this in Scripture, usually what the preacher wants to do is kind of take some of the bite out of the statement. And so the first thing they'll say is, well, hate doesn't mean hate here. Hate means love less. And uh, I'm wary of doing that. Now, I understand the need to not want to say God hates anyone. I understand that, okay? I'm as uneasy with the concept as you are. However, the language is what it is in Scripture, and it appears in multiple ways. So Paul quotes from this exact verse in Romans chapter 9. We'll look at that in just a moment, and it's the major reason that I'm a little wary of just saying, oh, it just means love less here, okay? But secondly, remember when Jesus was talking about uh, being his disciple. And he said, anyone who does not hate father and mother, you know, that kind of thing. Um, So this is language that's used to encourage, uh, to uh, demonstrate loyalty. And uh, I don't want to take any of the bite out of it, even though I realize that that leaves us in a little bit of a weird place. How can God hate anyone? Now, I will say this, and I do think it's important to note that Um, The way we see God's love or hate in any um, circumstance is by the way that they are treated. So from the uh, people of Israel's perspective, they can know they're loved because God has taken care of them. God has chosen them. Trust me, back in Malachi's day, nobody's sitting around going, oh, you you hate the people of Esau? Oh. They're saying, well, of course he does. We already know this, right? God chose us. So that's not a a big theological bridge for them to have to cross. But for us, especially after Jesus, the idea that God hates anyone, it, it can be hard to swallow. But let me show you how Paul used this passage in Romans chapter 9. Now he's talking about the fact that God can choose whomever he chooses. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. So, He's going to go on and make the point, this is exactly how it works with Israel. And those who, uh, of the people of Israel who believe in Jesus as the Messiah continue to receive the blessing. However, there are those with hard hearts who reject him. Okay, so this is part of a bigger argument. But realize there's a fundamental principle that he's laying out here, which is that God can show mercy to whom he shows, wants to show mercy, and he can show, um, and uh, he can harden whomever he wants to harden. 
That's his prerogative, not ours. And he does not have to answer for that. Okay? That's, that's his, um, his, his right as God. So there's some things in, in Romans 9 and 10 where, where Paul says things like, hey, if a potter makes a piece of pottery, he doesn't have a right to do with it whatever he wants. What if, he even says this. Now, he, it's like he's, he's just proposing it without really suggesting it, which is what if, what if a potter made a pot just to throw it in the fire? Can a potter do that? Is it his prerogative to do that? Of course, right? He's the one that made it. He can do whatever he wants. Okay, so this is some of the stickier parts of uh, Scripture when we deal with the fact that Paul gladly quotes the Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. God decided to have mercy on Jacob, not on Esau. He decided to have compassion on uh, Jacob, not Esau, because God can do that. So um, the... The place it's supposed to put us is in the fact that God has chosen to have mercy on us. Specifically in that the invitation from Jesus goes for all the descendants of Israel, all the descendants of Esau, and to all the Gentiles that we can have hope in in God. But in the Old Testament, when God elects someone, then it says, not by works, not by something that humans did. Why did God choose Abraham? Abraham. Because he chose Abraham. That's why. Not because Abraham was necessarily the best man. He was the smartest man. He chose Abraham because he chose Abraham. Now, Abraham ultimately wound up being faithful. But he wasn't always faithful, was he? There are times when he did the wrong thing. And that's the way it is for Israel. And so God will say specifically, I didn't choose you because you were more numerous or because you were more lovely or more powerful. I chose you because I chose you. And when God chooses, he does. So, I spent a lot of time talking about that. Didn't mean to to spend all of it, but I wanted to see that is a a difficult part of Scripture where we got to kind of wrap our minds around the uh, concept scripturally that the Bible says God hates. He doesn't hate like a human hates. Okay? When I deal with hate in my own heart, it's because of my own selfishness. Um, It's because of my own sinful desires. It's because of my own inability to... Um, show mercy even though I've been shown mercy that kind of thing so I don't want to attribute that kind of malice to God but ultimately it's his choice not mine all right the rest of these won't take that long okay but since we dealt with that verse I felt it important to at least talk about it a little bit so the next two questions are in verse sixes and seven how have we shown contempt for your name how have we defiled you so in context It says, a son honors his father and a slave his master. If I'm a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. It is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. There's the first answer. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. That's the second answer. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? So how have they shown contempt? How have they defiled? Well, because they bring less than acceptable sacrifices to the temple. I should have started off by saying this. All of the minor prophets are working towards the, uh, ultimately, the establishment of a kingdom there around Jerusalem with its temple and by the time you get to Malachi the temple has been rebuilt and it's supposed to be glory days now everything's good we finally got the system the way it's supposed to be and what are they doing exactly what their ancestors did so when they get to their temple what do they do they don't take it seriously they complain about it they refuse to bring God the first fruits and so God says This is how you've shown contempt for me. This is how you have defiled me. The next two questions later in chapter one are actually statements. They say, the Lord's table is defiled. And you say, what a burden. And you sniff at contemptuously. So in context, oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations. From where the sun rises, 
to where it sits. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it by saying the Lord's table is defiled and its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden, and you sniffed at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. So you can see the temple is still front and center in the minor prophets, but here it's the fact that the temple is being defiled because people refuse to bring the right kinds of sacrifices. The right kind of sacrifices are truly sacrifices. They're the best you've got, and therefore they cost the most, what you want to get rid of the least. Likewise, many people have discarded animals or have animals that they might not be able to eat, that they might not be able to sell. And those are the ones they're bringing to the altar. So they're giving God the leftovers, in other words. Chapter 2, the question is why, but it's part of a bigger statement. You weep and wail. Because he, that's God, no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. And you ask, why? So in context, do we not all have one father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our our ancestors by being unfaithful to one another? Judah has been unfaithful. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying women who worship a foreign God. As for the man who does this, whoever he may be, may the Lord remove from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings an offering to the Lord Almighty. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why. It's because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. So, In chapter 2, we start dealing with unfaithfulness. And there are two ways that Israel has been unfaithful. One is that they have, the men have intermarried with foreign women. Now, it might be tempting to read something racial into this, but that's not the point. God is not upset because they are somehow diluting the bloodline of Jacob. That's not, that's not what's in view at all here, okay? So it's not like some kind of racial purity. Instead, his concern is idolatry. And so when the people return to rebuild their temple, they're surrounded by uh, a Persian government. They're, they're, you know, I mean, the Persian government's helping oversee the building of the temple. And you've got uh, Persian subjects from all over the place around. And Imagine specifically there are a lot of young men who are there, who, there to build the temple. And when you've got a lot of young men congregated in one place, then you have usually um, they have to look for women. You know, they, they can't look from their own little tribe anymore. They've got to start looking outside. So you can imagine that these men find women from, from the area, right? And they eventually marry them. And by itself, that's not a sin, except for the fact that invariably these women don't worship the God of Israel. And so, as you see in the Old Testament, usually intermarriage results in the people of God being taken into idolatry. Now, it doesn't always work that way, but usually it does. And so, he says he's upset because they marry women who worship a foreign God. Okay, so this leads them into idolatry. And that's what he's upset about. But that's not the only unfaithfulness he's upset about. The second one is this. They're unfaithful to their wives then. And they want to divorce them. So the second part of, chapter, uh, of the complaint that God has in chapter 2 is the fact that these men are being unfaithful to their wives and they're divorcing their wives. So it's a big deal that you can't just divorce your wife for, you know, silly reasons. So even though Deuteronomy allowed for the fact, God is upset that these men are not being faithful. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Continuing on in chapter 2, they ask, how have we wearied him? In context, 
You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or, where is the God of justice? So, in other words, they're doubting the goodness of God. Because they look around and see what their ancestors have seen. What you and I see, which is that oftentimes in this world, evil people prevail. And even though the book of Proverbs tells us that if we trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding, that God will direct our paths, right? Even though it says that, we see sometimes that it didn't work out the way it's supposed to, or at least the way we think it's supposed to. And we see that bad people can really get ahead in this world. And they can do bad things over and over again. Now, there is a faithful way to respond to God in this. And so we've talked about the fact the book of Lamentations is all about this faithful lament to say to God, I know you're good, but things aren't the way they're supposed to be. Help me understand this. Help me believe in you more. Okay, that's a faithful way. There's also an unfaithful way to say, God, yeah, you're some God. Look at all this evil that uh, uh, prevails and you're doing nothing about it. So where is the God of justice? So they, you know, kind of cynically look look up and say, eh, God doesn't love us anymore. God's not taking care of us anymore. Chapter three, you ask, how are we to return? You ask, how are we robbing you? So in context, he says, I, the Lord, do not change. By the way, that, that by itself is just like 10 sermons right there, isn't it? I, the Lord, do not change. What I love about the scriptures is they're, they're so rich. So on the one hand, God doesn't change. On the other hand, the Bible says over and over at times when God changes, right? You remember when God was going to destroy the people of Israel because they um, had made the golden calf and Moses interceded for the people and the Bible says and God relented of the evil that he was going to do King James God repented that's what it says so God does change in some sense but the very essence and nature of God never changes so again that's just so rich and deep I'm glad he changes when he does because that means our prayers matter but I'm also glad he never changes because he's he's the same God today tomorrow, yesterday, forever. That's what Hebrews says. Anyway, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there be not, will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruits before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. So he says, you got to return to me. Okay, how do we return to you? Well, you got to quit robbing me. All right, how do we quit robbing you? How, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. So you know the word tithe just means a tenth. And the law of Moses said specifically that the people were to give a tenth of everything. So they give a tenth of their income, if you will, of their crops. And that even went down to the smaller things. Now, that wasn't the only um, gift that God required in the old law so it's not right to say that the Jews were expected to give 10% that was the bare minimum actually when you add up all the different ways they were supposed to make offerings it added up probably more like to 20 or 30% but having said that the emphasis here is on the 10% in tithes and offerings so if you've been in the church of Christ long enough then you'll know this our tradition says we don't teach tithing because in the New Testament, nowhere is that said specifically that you have to give 10%. You do need to be a joyful giver. You need to, be, you need to give 
um, as um, an act of obedience and also an act of thankfulness to God, but we don't set a specific percentage. But then, if you've been in the church of Christ long enough, you always say, but in the Old Testament, there's a tithe thing, so probably 10% is good, <laughs> right? And I think that's decent logic. Y- yes, the, Old, the New Testament doesn't say you've got to give 10%, but let me say this, we should. We should give 10%. We should probably give more than 10%. In fact, I'll say it this way, the wealthier we are, probably the higher percentage we should give away. I mean, you just got to do the math. If I make $50,000 a year and I give um, 10%, I'm giving $5,000, I'm living off $45,000 a year. If I make $500,000 a year and I give 10%, I'm giving $50,000, which is a lot of money. I mean, it's as much as the first guy makes, but I got $455,000 to live off of every year. Right? It probably wouldn't hurt me to sacrifice a little more. However, it would be wrong for me to tell you what God expects you to do. All right? So ultimately, that's going to be between you and God. But man, I couldn't help when I was reading Malachi this week to think, all right, God, am I giving you my first fruits? Am I really making a sacrifice to you? Or am I just, you know, bringing the little leftovers again? Because one of the things I've noted is... Um, uh, as Mary and I've gotten older, our income has gone up, and I'm very thankful for that. Okay, we've had kids, and they have college, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, there there are lots of things, but I, but I look up and go, all right, has my reasoning changed? Am I am I really willing to give till it hurts? That's what sacrifice is, right? Is is it means something? So, this is the one place in Scripture that I can tell. Maybe you'll correct me. Okay, I might be wrong, but this is the only place in Scripture where God actually says, test me. Usually God says, don't test me. This is the only time in Scripture where God says, test me in this. I dare you, he says. Give till it hurts and see if you aren't blessed. Do it. So, You want to see if God is good? Try him. Give until it hurts and see if you aren't blessed. Um, I don't have any miracle stories here, but I'll say this. Every time that Mary and I have decided to give above and beyond what we normally do, every single time, in some way, a new blessing comes back to us. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's not. I do remember one time, uh, back when I was the campus minister at Raiders for Christ, there was, there, there was someone in our group who was going on a mission trip, and I remember thinking, um, you know, eh, this month not a good month. You know, it was one of those lean months and everything, and we'd already given what we'd pledged and everything. However, we ultimately decided to give, I want to say it was $300, okay? Good thing to do. And Uh, I remember, okay, this is like 17 years ago, so forgive me, I don't remember all the details, but I do remember that within a few days, we had an unexpected um, uh, inflow of cash of almost exactly the same amount. Now, could have just been complete chance, right? Could have been. But why would I view it that way? I think it was God just reminded me, hey, it was only $300. I got a lot more than $300. I can bless you in this. Try me in this. See if you won't receive blessing upon blessing. Now, I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel so that, you know, you uh, give to God to become rich. No, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this. God promises. He has a whole storehouse of blessings that he'll just pour upon us if we'll trust him. Other translations say, try me in this. Test me in this. It's a really profound part of Malachi. Because they don't really trust them, ultimately, right? They're not offering their first fruits. They're not offering the best. Okay. I find it ironic in chapter 3, verse 13. You ask, what have we said against you? When clearly they've said plenty against him. Um, in fact, um, now I don't want this, this to reflect on my own children because honestly, they don't talk this way to us, okay? So let me, let me say that to start with. But I still thinking of, of um, the people as like this, you know, kind of, uh, this uh, teenager whose parents give them everything and they're completely thankless for it and all they do is complain about it and then if the parent points them out they're like why what did I say I didn't say anything you know kind of like that what 
so that, you know, people kind of look up and do that. What have we said against you? You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You've said it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certain evildoers prosper. And even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. So again, they're just grumbling. That's not the way it's supposed to be, you know, that, that even though we do what God says, we have to go around sad all the time, you know. A lot of uh, self-serving language in this. So these are the questions that they ask God. And so in a sense, what's happened is they've put God on trial. Because they're saying, God, you've got to give an answer for all this. Why is it not the way we want it to be? That kind of thing. Well, we've read most of the first three chapters of Malachi, but we haven't read all of them. And I do want to get uh, the beginning of chapter 3. So this is not part of the, I mean, excuse me, the rest of chapter 3, because this is not part of the question and answer part, okay? So there's kind of like, like a, um, a little segue here in chapter 3 where, where it, the story changes focus. So it says in chapter 3, verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. On the day I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession, and I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Okay, so see the... How it changes now, it's, it's given a, a narrative, a so story form of how some people responded. And so this remnant of people, those who feared the Lord, they got together and they said, we're going to take this seriously. And the, the language here is really striking because you've got a scroll of remembrance that's written. So it's like a book of life or a book of names where people, the people who are actually listening to God, their names are being written down. But who's writing the book? This one puzzled me for a while. Some translations just say it outright, and so I, I think this is what the Scripture is getting at. It was a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence, in God's presence. Well, who's writing this? I think this is a roundabout way of saying God wrote their names in a book, which is very consistent with Old and New Testament concepts of it. In fact, one time when Moses was challenging God, he said, look, if you need, just blot my name out of your book. Okay, so it's as if God has got this list of the righteous that he's going with, and their names are being added to it. And he says, they'll be my treasured possession. See that? But there's language that we kind of missed, and that's because of the way I've structured the class. So that you could miss, there are several references to the day in the book of Malachi, and you don't need to leave here without realizing this, okay, because Malachi is really pointing forward towards a future day. And so he's saying, on that day when I act. So it's the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, the coming of the Lord. These are all the, the days, or you know, reference to that day. But throughout the book of Malachi, it's this horrible day that everybody's going to hate, except for the people who listen to God. On that day when I act, they'll be my treasure possession. I will spare them. So they, the day coming for them is good news. They're looking forward to that day. Okay, so that gets us uh, to Malachi, oh, excuse me, the beginning of the chapter that we left out. I'll reference just a moment ago. To, to re see Malachi's ref uh, relevance to the New Testament, we got to get this part in there, chapters 3 and 4. Chapter 3, verse 1, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in the days gone by, as in former years. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against your sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. 
So here we have reference to the day of his coming. You see that? But I hope your spidey senses were tingling when you read this part. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Does that sound like anybody? Anybody in the New Testament? All right, ring us some bells. John the Baptist, good. And we're going to see more reference to that in chapter 4. So we're getting this prophecy about on this, uh, before this day, I'm going to send a messenger. All right, that's kind of the idea. And, and what's going to happen on that day is I'm going to refine. I'm going to sift through. I'm going to clean out, if you will. And what's he going to be judging, he says? Sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers. Okay, so people who are, who are practicing some kind of witchcraft, people who are sexually immoral, people who, are lie, who lie and not only lie, but lie in a court of law against other people. Against those who defraud laborers of their wages. And you know how many times the Bible talks about paying fair wages? Maybe more than you realize. It certainly was more than I realized. We'll, we'll look at that in a minute, Okay. So he says, uh, against those who defraud laborers of their wages. The book of James, it says this. Hey, you rich people, weep. The unpaid wages of your laborers are crying out to me. That's New Testament. It's striking to me how often that comes up. Those who oppress widows and the fatherless. Remember what James says? What's religion that God accepts that's pure? To look after widows and orphans and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And those who deprive foreigners of justice. So, it's the religious stuff that they're doing wrong. It's the sexual stuff they're doing wrong. And it's the way they're treating the most vulnerable in their society. That gets us to chapter 4. Sorry, I've already emphasized these things. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, and the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them, but for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. There will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah, Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of their parents to their children and the hearts of their children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. So this day that's coming that will be a horrible day for some, before it happens, he's going to send the prophet Elijah, who of course has already gone on, right? I mean, uh, so he's, he's a character from the past, However, oh man, I, I don't have time to make uh, all the points I'm going to make, so I'll have to, to skip ahead. However, he does come in a certain form, and that's in John the Baptist. We'll look at that in just a second. Let me finish up with this. This is how the Old Testament ends. I will send the prophet Elijah to you. So it's kind of with this expectation that the day of the Lord is coming, but that we're going to see God's messenger come before that happens. That's the way the Old Testament ends for Christians. And I say it that way because that's the way we've organized our Bibles. So this is the last book of the Old Testament. The Jews don't actually do that, okay? For the Jews, the last book of the Bible is Second Chronicles. And it actually ends talking about Cyrus and rebuilding the temple. Um, but it's so different kind of um, way that Christians and Jews even read the Old Testament and how they interpret it oftentimes. So... Um, as he points them back to the law, he says, I will send the prophet Elijah ahead to you. And as it says in Luke chapter 1, talking about Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, he says, Zechariah, your prayer's been heard, and you're going to have a kid. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Turn the hearts of the parents to their children. That's exactly what it says in Malachi. So John the Baptist comes as Elijah, pointing the way towards Jesus, who is ultimately the one who prepares us for the coming of the day of the Lord. All right, that's our study of the minor prophets. Thanks so much for, for your attention there.
Next Sunday, we have our big combined gathering at the MTSU baseball field. And then, Lord willing, after that, we're going to launch into a study of the wisdom books of the Old Testament. Thanks so much for your attention. You're dismissed.